Hey everybody, this is Matthew Clickstein here, author of such books as Slime and Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, welcoming you to a whole new podcast. It's called Nerds, N-E-R-T-Z. We're going to be talking with people and about things from all over the nerd and geek culture spectrum, video games, comic books, and why your cell phone might feel like it's vibrating in your pocket, even though you know that you left it on the table in the other room. We're really glad that you're here with us today. Producer is my lovely young friend, Rob Schulte. Music is by Mark Johnston. He's whipped up some riffs there that are going to get stuck in your head, and you're going to be humming them forevermore. Check us out at nerdspodcast.com. That's N-E-R-T-Z. And here we go. About a year ago, I read Emma Donahue's Room. I really enjoyed it. Unlike the movie, uh, the book is completely told from the perspective of the five-year-old son, Jack, who lives with his very young mother in basically a garden shack in the back of an anonymous person's backyard. They've been uh, kept there for the entire life of, of Jack's existence and much of the life of the young mother. What was kind of fascinating about this to me was, uh, and they develop it a lot more in the book, Jack has a connection to the characters he watches on the TV screen. They're really the only other people in his cloistered world. He doesn't know anything outside of the room that he and his mother live in. She's kind of created this fantasy reality for him where he really thinks the whole world is the room, and so the characters he's watching on screen are real. They're his friends. It's especially profound for him when he's watching Watching shows like Dora the Explorer because as you may or may not know on Dora the Explorer in addition to her speaking directly to the audience even as a cartoon character breaking that fourth wall she'll actually pause after asking a question you know what do you think what color is this is this right is this wrong and she'll wait for the viewer to answer her the viewer allegedly answers her and then she'll continue with what she's saying so it almost seems to a child watching it that that child is actually affecting the the action on screen and that's basically what's going on with the narrator the five-year-old narrator in room they developed this a little bit in the film that just came out recently that's winning a lot of awards right now but when I read that and then you know I was thinking about it and watching the film as well I spoke with a few different people about how does this work today how does this work with adults does this make adults who have watched those kinds of programs as children feel as though they actually have some kind of strange connection to these characters on screen do they feel even a sense of entitlement or empowerment that they can actually affect what's going on on screen Um, and I just thought that was kind of interesting especially in the idea of geeking out why people connect so intensely with characters on screen a lot of the nostalgia that's going on right now, uh, people thinking that these characters are, you know, almost a real part of their lives in a way, you know, they're spending so much money on going to these reunions and so forth. And uh, after speaking with a few different people, I got to a woman named Sandra, Dr. Sandra Calvert, based out of Georgetown University. We spoke a little bit about what she calls parasocial relationships and parasocial interactions. You know, my first question to her, what does this all mean? Where does this come from? And why do people geek out so hard? Why do they connect so intimately with these characters on screen, especially these days? As it turns out, part of the problem with talking with Dr. Calvert about parasocial relationships is there hasn't been enough of what she calls longitudinal research into this yet. Basically, because they just started looking into this in the last 10 or 20 years, it's hard to tell how things like TV has affected children who are only now starting to become adults in their 20s and 30s. People have just started looking at parasocial relationships with children. The topic used to be called parasocial interactions with adults, and it's embedded in some basic human attributes like trust and, you know, attachments to characters. They've been around forever and a day, so it's nothing new. People often, if you look at the old, old literature that comes out of communications, it was based in newscasters that there was like a trusted newscaster and that they used these techniques where they would look straight at the audience and address them as if they're having a conversation, which newscasters still do. And people develop preferences for who it was they wanted to see, who they trusted, you know, who was the voice of authority for them. And so there are social emotional things that went in with these cognitive decisions. We spoke a little while longer about the earliest ideas of parasocial relationships and where they came from before I started wondering, well, 
how have things changed? What's the research looking into now? What's changed in the media landscape now is that characters are everywhere, that it's ubiquitous. And some of those for children are animated characters or people like Mr. Rogers. I was getting a pretty good idea how parasocial relationships work with children and their watching of cartoons. But how does this change over time as we get older? One of the things that we do with things that are fiction, even as adults, is when we see stories, we agree to suspend our, our understanding of what's real and what's not. So to become immersed in a television show, you have to decide to treat those characters as if they're real and that you're not watching a stage production, that, that, you, that it has a life of its own. The conversation was actually bringing up a lot more questions than answers at this point, one of which being, is there a difference between these relationships dealing with cartoons and characters that are live action? Even if those are not real people, in quotes, in terms of what they're doing right there, that, you know, instead that they're actors, that we're, we're treating them because as real, because those actors represent some quality of human experience that resonate with all of us. So when you're looking at people on a screen, it's not that fundamentally different to make that sort of a leap. Or, you know, seeing them on a game or seeing them everywhere, that these characters become real to us and we become attached to them. But there are developmental changes in how well children understand what's real and what's pretend with a major shift changing at the end of childhood. To Dr. Calvert and experts like her, what exactly does early childhood mean? We're like about seven, eight, you know, somewhere around then. Although, if it's a live character, it probably pushes the boundaries even further if it's an actor. But for little kids, that sort of understanding of what's real and pretend is just emerging. Mm -hmm. But as you move into later periods of development and you understand that that's pretend and not real, and they, children understand that with animated characters first... Dr. Calvert revealed to me something kind of interesting about suspension of disbelief. It doesn't really matter whether or not you realize those characters are fictional. The parasocial relationships still exist. Those characters still have an impact regardless of whether you know that they're pretend, in part because they act like real people. They have friends, they have faces, you know, they do things like kids do, they jump in mud puddles. You know, they have challenges and conflicts that they have to address. And all kids' programs are made with those, although they're simpler when they're younger than when they're older. But what, what's this ongoing strain and thread is that we all develop these kind of emotionally tinged feelings for these characters. And that those continue with, with you know, we're finding for about, about two years for little kids, but if you look back on them, there's probably still a nostalgia. I mean, who was your first favorite character when you were a kid? This was an easy answer. Calvin from Calvin Hobbes. I still remember when I was around four or five and found a bunch of Calvin Hobbes books in a box in the garage. I was just mystified by the pictures that I saw. I couldn't really understand what he was talking about. The words that he used were pretty big. But as I got older, I started understanding what he was saying a lot more. It was almost as though he and his stuffed tiger Hobbs were traveling along with me as I grew older. And I got into just as many adventures as they did. That's part of it. You look back and it's like they're your old friends. You know, and that they were part of your world when you were little and that they were part of your pretend world. So even though you know that Calvin is not a real person or you know, like, like doesn't really talk, you still treat him because he had, he met emotional needs for you and cognitive needs too. You still treat him as if he were real. We broached the subject of what happens to these relationships when we move into adolescence. And at this point, Dr. Calvert brought up a favorite popular culture icon that I think you might know about. One of my favorites for parasocial relationships is the characters from Harry Potter, you know, because there's a whole generation of children who grew up with Harry Potter, reading the books, watching the characters, you know, immersed in everything that those characters were doing. And so they were fascinated 
and they were live characters. And one of the things that a live character can do that an animated character cannot is that those live characters age up with you. So the developmental needs that you have at a certain point in time are also emerging for the characters that you're watching on screen. They're maturing physically, cognitively, emotionally. They're having new kinds of demands made on them. And those are the sorts of things that animated characters stay the same age. This idea reminded me a little bit of a joke that comes up a lot on The Simpsons. Every now and then they kind of make fun of the fact that the characters, even though it's been about 25 years, haven't grown any older. Bart is still 10, Lisa's still 8, everyone else on the show, they're staying the same age. But, you know, we still have those childhood memories of having grown up with them, even though we've gotten older, and they haven't. What's kind of cool about live-action characters, though, is they do grow older. And if we're lucky enough to be the same age as they, like with the Harry Potter characters and people who are around the same age as those characters when those movies first came out, you're going through those same things that they are, both in the movies and, frankly, the actors themselves. Puberty, dealing with girls or guys, dealing with, you know, just getting older in general. It's kind of like people who are a little bit older who are growing up with characters like Clarissa on Nickelodeon or Pete and Pete. I think there's a there's really a great potential to have long standing relationships with those characters that are more than nostalgic. I mean, I think people would watch more Harry Potter if they showed them in a current time frame. This led us into a discussion going far beyond mere relationships and direct address. What about interactions and the idea of people feeling as though they can actually control what they're watching on screen? Remind me a little bit of the character of Mildred in Fahrenheit 451, the wife of the main character Montag, who believed that she could actually control and communicate with the characters on the screen she was watching for her favorite show, The Family. Let me just theoretically separate out parasocial interaction and parasocial relationship because we did just that because of the character's direct address and waiting for pausing for responses and the child feeling like they're in a pseudo conversation, which is the essence of interactivity. So, you know, the, the, it creates a more responsive environment. Having characters directly address the audience is breaking the fourth wall. And you've seen it in uh, Terika Jessica, Jessica Parker in what was the name Sex of the show? City. Sex in the City. Yeah. Did that in some of those initial episodes and then they dropped it out. Parasocial interaction techniques can lead to parasocial relationships, but they're not necessary for a parasocial relationship. You can just watch characters on screen and have an emotional investment in them, and they never talk to you at all. Parasocial interaction techniques, as you point out, drop out of children's programs by the time they're in grade school. You know, so, I mean, it really ceases to be after you get out of that period where children are in what would traditionally be called pre-operational thought, where there's less logical thinking, that no longer takes place. So you don't see see kids' programs made that way or adult programs made that way. So if it were such a powerful sort of a technique, you would expect that to continue. People don't find that to be engaging. Of course parasocial interactions are going to drop out after we get a little older. We know better. We know that we can't control what's going on on the screen. That's why I don't really see these kinds of things in adult programming or you know, things like choose your own adventure books, unless they're for adults in a way that's like a parody. Or, you know, we know better. They realize when they're talking back to a screen that you're really not impacting it. You're just kind of having a, it's like a pseudo conversation. So if you're having a conversation and you think you're having a conversation, you are. But if you don't think you're having a conversation, you're not. And as you get older, you figure out that that's not really taking place. As the conversation wound down, something was still itching at me. Could these parasocial interactions that allegedly go away after we get older be extended now that there's so much social media in our world? One thing I have done is some research with Facebook. And that one of the things that students said to me, these were undergraduates, is that they felt like they were the stars, you know, and that that was one of the things that had changed with these newer media. You know, in terms of any interaction that you have, one of my favorites that I use is what is an interaction? I remember going to a restaurant with a good friend once. We were sitting there at a booth, 
and I was having a conversation with her, and she said, shh, and I, and I looked at her, and she said, I'm listening to the conversation behind me. So I thought I was having a conversation, but she wasn't paying any attention at all to what I was saying to her. What is an interaction? You know, and, and is it like when we think we're having an interaction, are we? Uh, sometimes I talk to my classes, and I think they're listening to me, but sometimes they're not listening at all. I mean, they're, they're off, you know, at the beach, you know, doing something much more fun than listening to what I'm talking about. So when you're kind of having these sorts of, you know, kind of definitions of what is an interaction, what is a relationship, the, the friends sorts of things struck me in our Facebook study, too, because there were people with hundreds and thousands of friends. And I was like, seriously, how do you keep up with all these people? And you know, when, when you look at that, it's like people play footloose and fancy free with with what a friend is. And some people collect them thinking, you know, the more you have, the more popular you are. But, but does that mean you have a real relationship? Well, again, it goes back to perhaps it's all in the eye of the beholder, you know, and that maybe you do think you're having a relationship with them. But, but do they ever write something to you, directly address you? I mean, do you ever have those kinds of experiences? And so that would be something that people, as they get older, might do a little more in terms of reflection, thinking about things. Wow, now I know everything about everything. And since you listen to this podcast, you should too. Thanks for listening to the first ever podcast for nerds, everybody. Producer again was Rob Schulte. If you want to check out Rob and all of his crazy creative machinations online, you can check him out at Rob, R-O-B, K as in kangaroo, Schulte, S-C-H-U-L-T-E dot com, or his other podcast, Doing It with Mike Sachs, that's S-A-C-K-S, and G-F-Y with Max and Rob. Music was by my good friend Mark Johnson. I don't know where the hell you can find him, but he's out there somewhere probably. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Sandra Calvert for talking with us today. Please check back in in the future as we talk with all different kinds of people from neurologists to psychologists to filmmakers, writers, musicians, and God knows whomever else. And you can find me online at www.matthewclickstein.com. Make sure that you leave just one T in the Matthew. That actually is how my name is spelled. And of course, you can find out more about Slimed and Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age at www.slimedthebook.com. Hey everyone, producer Rob Schulte here. I just wanted to come in here at the end and say you can find the companion piece to this podcast on Wired.com. It's a really great piece written by Matthew Clickstein, and you're probably going to enjoy it. Maybe not, but I think you will. If you'd like to have any cheese, popcorn, or money given to us, you can find our email on our website, nerdspodcast.com. That's N-E-R-T-Z podcast.com, which also has our email for anyone that is out there looking to be a sponsor for the show. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the world that you've been... De- I'll just cut this out. <laughs> I actually kind of like you keeping that part. Okay, sure.